I'm James Milan, and this is Talk of the Town. Welcome. Um, today, we are going to be talking about a subject that is very serious here in Massachusetts and nationwide, very familiar, I think, to all of our audience as well, and that is substance use disorder. Uh, its current manifestations and what can be done about it, including myths about addiction, et cetera. And to do that with me, I have, uh, he doesn't see himself as an expert, but I do. Will LaCouture is joining me. Hi, Will. James, nice to see you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for being here. Will is the Director of Community Outreach for Brightview, Massachusetts. And Brightview runs uh, in a number of states. Uh, outpatient uh, addiction treatment centers, and so Will has, spends his professional life in this space, and we want to tap into his knowledge um, and talk uh, extensively and uh, at, and in some depth about what the current situation is. So, again, I thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. Can you start um, us off by just uh, actually at the most basic level, um, why not start there? I think most of our audience is already going to be able to supply an answer of their own to this, but what is addiction? It's a disease, and uh, it's something that uh, people can't control. It's, it's, it's like having heart disease. You, you don't choose to have heart disease. You don't choose to be an addict, and it's something that can be treated. Uh, with medication. Mm -hmm. And I actually want to start, before we start talking about the services that Brightview and other such uh, companies provide and also what the, the, what the general uh, issues are here in Massachusetts, I'd actually would like to start with uh, the things that people think that aren't accurate and that aren't true about addiction and treatment for addiction, et cetera. So what are some myths uh, that you're probably very familiar with that you can share with us? That's a great question, uh, James. It, you know, some of the factors in the society is, is uh, people can cut, co cut cold turkey on it, and that's, that's not the case. Um, if people don't get the proper treatment on it, it can be deadly. And, uh, you know, people that have addiction, uh, we need to treat these people that have addiction like they have a, a normal disease, I don't know, disease, heart disease, diabetes. You treat them with passion and, and empathy and you give them the resources to help because if they're not um, getting those type of resources, they may not want to uh, go to treatment and they may start using more drugs more because uh, they're not feeling, they're feeling ostracized, they're feeling excluded from, from society. If we educate society on helping people in the community and, and the resources that are available to people that need to get uh, addiction uh, recovery, that's the big thing right there is, is just helping them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're speaking to there is like this stigma, which we're all very familiar with, right, which um, makes us think collectively about such people who are, who are in need of, um, of, of treatment um, for substance use disorder, we, we may think of them as, oh, they put them, you know, they got themselves into that situation, they should get themselves out, or, oh, those, that, that poor person, too bad for him or her. Um, again, not really uh, seeing s people in those situations with compassion um, and the sense that, oh, you know, there but for the grace of God, blah, 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 um, but instead, it's really, we are excluding them, in a sense, as a society. It's part of what I think you are both combating against and trying to educate around. Yeah, if we educate this, uh, the community, you know, like we're working with a lot of local police departments uh, and providing resources to them as far as some of our partners so that we're able to help people get uh, help at our, at our centers and also our competitors because, uh, as you and I were talking earlier, is this is an area where we're not competing against you, we're here to help people. And we want to utilize, if we can't help someone here, we want to get them help right away because uh, a day could go by and they're not getting help, that could be deadly. And uh, we can't just uh, put someone on a waiting list for three weeks. We need to help them right away. And that's where Brightview uh, offers patients to come in, walk in uh, during the week. And that's something that we really take great pride in, in trying to find uh, and help them and find the resources right then and there. And we customize, um, and, and a lot of other people do too, as far as our patient services, is we try to customize what we're doing for the, for the patient to help them as far as what's going on in their life. Right, because every patient, as we know, is different. And I do want to just kind of follow up on something you were just saying. And 
again, kind of delineate the many ways in which the work that you're doing and the space in which you're doing it is just fundamentally different from what we think about as, you know, businesses competing against Correct. each other, right? This is not somebody walking into your car dealership and you want to make sure they buy that car from you and not from the guy down the street. Right. Because you've just said it yourself. This problem is too big. It's a societal problem. You are now putting yourselves on the front lines of something that we all have an interest in, but you guys are, can and are actually do, doing something about. So in order for that to happen, you need to, I assume, work in conjunction with other people providing, or other businesses providing similar services, um, and also with other, uh, other kind of, uh, I, I was t almost tempted to start saying kind of social welfare services, which a police department, most people don't see a police department as, but here in Arlington, we have a, a, a recent history going back at least 10 years, if not more, of a police really seeing themselves as tackling this problem, especially the problem of opioid addiction, in a way that does not stigmatize, that does not try and criminalize behavior that, as you said, is more around health and around disease and around treatment of disease and not, again, uh, incarceration or uh, some other form of isolating those people who are suffering. Instead, seeing themselves as, as, as being among the providers uh, of recovery services, in a sense. Do you guys work, actually, with the Arlington Police Department? Yes, we have. We work in, uh, we just actually had some representatives over to our uh, center uh, over on Mass Ave uh, a week or so ago, mm -hmm. actually last week on the 15th. And uh, we've met with uh, the chief of police as well too, and uh, they're awesome to work with. Um, they, they really want to help within the, the, the community and also set an example here in Massachusetts as far as some of the things that they're doing as far as uh, uh, addiction and recovery t towards getting uh, for the, uh, the addiction. and. Um, we provide services back to them as well too. We're not just here to help uh, their patients get outpatient services for recovery for uh, their addiction, but we also want to help them as far as transportation to uh, the facility, uh, whether they need a job, uh, food, um, some of the essentials for everyday life. And we have a, a resource, a referral network that we utilize a lot of services that we want to actually expand and give to our uh, partners that we work with as well, whether it's the police department or if it's a, a hospital, uh, it could be, uh, you know, uh, the parole officer. Uh, we're trying to make people's lives better, and one step is starting with treating the addiction. Mm -hmm. And again, you, you see yourselves as part of a network of different services to, again, address this issue, which has so many different facets to it, not simply the physical addiction uh, component that you guys really deal with, uh, you know, very directly. Um, let's take a step back for a sec, if you don't mind, and and um, and talk about like what the overall situation is like at the moment here in Massachusetts, which I assume you, as the 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 director uh, for community outreach for the state in general, you're probably aware of like what are the things that are most troubling, most uh, concerning for us as a population in this space of l just substance, substance abuse, let's say. What are the drugs that are most worrisome at the moment? What are the kinds of things that, w what, are, what are we seeing here? Great question. Uh, there's, you know, there's obviously the opioids is a major, major problem. And um, there's also uh, the fentanyl. Uh, and then it's now also now uh, the trank that is actually now found in um, the fentanyl as far as a, a, a horse tranquilizer. And, and that's a major concern because the Narcan can't really, can't help on that. And it's, it's really alarming in many ways. Obviously there's alcohol, uh, there's uh, cocaine, there's all these other drugs that are out there that is major pro uh, problems here in Massachusetts and throughout the country. But at the same point, there's other uh, drugs as well too that can cause addiction, you know, sleeping pills, depression, um, you know, attention deficit type of uh, medication. Mm -hmm. These are what we're seeing out there and it's, the issue is not going away anytime soon. Uh, we're here just to try to uh, help people 
recover and live a better life and deal with a lot of the the issues that they're dealing with as far as their addiction and uh, it's it's concerning and it's growing and and I know the government and the state has done an awful lot as far as putting resources back into helping people uh, we work a lot with a lot of hospitals state of Massachusetts has uh, set up these community behavioral health centers that we're working with uh, to help Patients, instead of going to the emergency room for addiction and overdoses, they're going now, they're trying to push them towards the community behavioral health centers, and we're working with a lot of these uh, centers to help people get off, uh, off their addiction. Mm -hmm. You know, you were, in what you were just saying, you mentioned Trank, and this is horse tranquilizer, I guess, that must be being cut in to, you know, uh, fentanyl, uh, which itself is also cut into other substances. Um, and then you mentioned that, that a big problem with that is that it is resistant or Narcan is not effective Correct. in that situation. Let's just uh, remind folks what Narcan is. Well, not, if someone overdoses on, on an opioid, Narcan is administrated and it helps save their life. That's mm -hmm. the big thing. We're trying to teach more and more people to how, how to be able to have, to, to administrate a Narcan and at the same point have them available. Police departments need to have these, uh, uh, hospitals have them as well too. So it's, it saves a lot of people's lives when they're overdosed. You know, I, as I was preparing for this interview and doing some reading to do so, um, I was surprised because I don't see it on display or something like that, um, to hear that Narcan is available in most pharmacies and at CVS, et cetera. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Yeah, I, I really, I assume that that is true. I have not yet done the, you know, the, the personal investigation of walking into uh, our local Walgreens or whatever, but uh, if that's the case, then uh, I, I assume that one of the things that you guys are trying to to make sure that people understand and educate and encourage people to do is carry Narcan with them. Right. Um, you know, again, just because they may know somebody who might need it or they may not know somebody who turns out to need it right. um, and they happen to be in the area. I assume it, Narcan does work that well, right? It does, yes. Yeah, and it's and it's the only game in town, I think, in that way. Is right. that right? Right, but it doesn't it doesn't help on the on the tranquilizer. Right, and that's so, the concern. Yeah, that sounds. It, yeah, that's a, that's a big concern. Right. Um, so one of the things I was wondering is um, you were mentioning before, and we should make it clear. I, I made the analogy to a uh, car dealership and to the fact that this is a societal problem, and that's a very big difference. But the other thing that we should talk about, and you did allude to the fact that uh, Brightview allows for walk-ins, is the fact that when somebody needs your services, when somebody is in crisis in this particular way, they need help right, right then. Correct. Right? We can't afford as a society for, or a community for them to have to wait for a week, two weeks, three weeks, which is so often the case. So how does it work uh, when somebody you know, walks in your door. Just kind of walk us through uh, what happens at that point. Great question. Is if, a, if a person walks in before 3 o'clock, five days a week, Monday through Friday, um, they will go through a, an intake process. Uh, they'll go through some uh, clinical and medical, uh, and then they'll be see, seen by a provider. There's a, some paperwork that has to be done. And then the next day, they do some follow-up as far as uh, setting up appointments, other services that they may need to have. And they, they actually, we actually set up a, a treatment plan customized towards that particular person so that it's no one plan is the same because everyone's life has got different demands. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having an outpatient service like this a lot of people don't have time to go away for a month for, for their addiction. It, it's, you know, it, this gives them an opportunity to continue their life with their family, their job, and also on their way to recovery. So uh, we feel very proud of what we're doing over at Brightview as far as having people come in because if someone is that day they want to get service and they can't see someone, the next day they may change their mind. We feel that that day they show up, we're going to walk them with open arms, give them resources that help them, uh, not just on outpatient services for, for their recovery, but other areas that we can help them, case managers, uh, group therapy, um, and a lot of other resources that we have as far as working with our patients. One of the things that, that I wonder about is whether, um, you know, I, I tend to think of people in need of these services and in crisis. 
and how easy or hard it is for them to recognize that for themselves. How often when you get somebody walking in, like we were just talking about, is that person, has that person made that decision for him or herself? Um, and how often is it that somebody else is escorting them there? Um, you know, to, again, to, in recognition that this is what needs to happen. You're going to see both both sides of it. There's you know, obviously there's some patients coming in because they're court ordered, mm. um, and when they have to do that, we, we, we're we're trying to help that person to, because they've been in in and out of the court system quite a bit. So obviously they're coming in with um, court order. A lot of other people come in uh, based on just they've had enough. They just want to they want to get help and they want to move forward. Other people are coming in uh, just because they've gotten out of the emergency room and they've been given a bridge script. Now they need to, they need to uh, take the next step to helping them get uh, recovery. Mm -hmm. And do you find that it's just it, it's it's different to work with people depending? Mm. L let me put it this way: How important is is the the patient's attitude towards his or her recovery? In the, in the chances for success of that recovery. In other words, if you've got somebody kind of dragged in there, either by court order or by a, a concerned family member or friend or something like that, is, is that already automatically starting with a, with, a, with a heavier lift for you and for the patient? Uh, yes and no. I think what it comes down to is how we, how we go about it. We're gonna treat that person as a person and treat the addiction as a disease. And by doing that, uh, we want to make them feel welcome and that we're here to support them and here to help them. They may have relapses as you go along, but we're not going to turn them away. We're going to continue to work with them. So if we show empathy and compassion to them, they don't feel like they're just pushed off to the side like sometimes society can do mm -hmm. with this particular disease. Um, you know, we just got to battle through that and work with them. And, and that's one of the big things about what we're doing here at Brightview as far as helping people. You're going to have some people push back. But when they're ready, they know that, hey, we were there for them. And you know what? I feel very comfortable going back and, and trying it again because sometimes their mindset may not be right then, right that, at that particular time. Mm -hmm. Maybe if they go home, maybe they think a little bit more, hey, that person was really trying to help me out. I mean, it was a little too hard on that person. You know what? I want to go back. How do you, do you, do you guys have any opportunity to know what happens when somebody's course of treatment is done uh, with you? So in other words, like you said, you're part of a network of different service providers to help, uh, and, and you are yourselves trying to facilitate uh, other services for, your, for a patient so that he or she, again, is not left a ground with just you know just having gone through this recovery process and then they're thrown back in without the same supports that they didn't have uh, earlier. So how much do you, are you able to see what happens or know what happens after a patient leaves? Well, like I said, the the, the treatment program for a patient is customized towards their needs and uh, what they're dealing with. And the provider that, that works with uh, the patient uh, sets that plan. And there's a course of how we go about it. You know, the MAT, the medication is, uh, for the uh, for addiction treatment, uh, is a program that helps the patient wean off of their addiction. And that's an area that really helps the patient because it does prove results. 90 days does make a difference. And mm -hmm. we've seen major results as far as reduction, as, as far as a lot of different things. And one of the areas that's right here is, you know, we've seen a decrease in substance abuse, 70% uh, by doing that. So you mean f in, in the in the patients that have come through your doors, correct? 70 reduction in substance abuse. When they on the when other they side. stay when they stay on the MAT program, that's mm -hmm. a big that's a big thing. The other area is a 50 percent decrease in alcohol consumption, um, 70 percent decrease in time spent in jail, um, 50 percent decrease in unemployment. 60 degrees uh, in, in arrests. So the by working and getting on the program with the MAT and working with the provider, it's a step. There may be some relapses, but you can't control that. But we're, we're continually trying to get them and the patient to move forward. And, and how they go about it is, is a process. So as they move, continually get better and better and better, they're weaned off of the medication and treatment, and then all of a sudden um, they're able to go back. And so if a patient stops coming in, we get worried. We're going we're gonna to follow up with that patient. We're not going to just let them go away. So, mm -hmm. And we work with our partners as far as that as well, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, the... I, I know that 
you you have uh, reminded us a couple of times for sure. So I don't want you to think that I wasn't listening. I know that you that each patient's course through your particular uh, you, you know your particular facilities is a customized course. Um, but is there like a an, an amount of time that you know is necessary for you know, most people to, to be able to commit to coming to those sessions over a, a course of time in order to, in order to ensure the best chances for success. Um, can somebody, so in other words, do you have a, a, again, customized as it is, is it like a three week program? Is it anything from three weeks to, you know, long time or? It or is it just really different for every it's single person? It's different for everyone. It, it, like I said, the 90 days, that's a real big part right there. The mm -hmm. first 90 days makes a major difference. Uh, some patients have longer periods because it depends on uh, the, the, uh, the addiction they have mm. towards a particular one. It could be an opioid, which is going to take longer. There's a whole process that we go through on that. So it's just not one particular customized, you know, one day a week or, mm -hmm. in, or three months and you're done. It could take longer. And I, and I think one thing is it's, it's always there. You're always recovering from your addiction mm -hmm. and you always have to have that support and, and then it goes into other facets of the support you have whether it's working with uh, group sessions mm -hmm. uh, working with other people a lot of people that you know are in the industry that are actually helping a lot of people with recovery are former addicts themselves mm -hmm. and that's so they know the language they they know what they're de dealt with and because they've been there mm -hmm. and that's that also helps the person that's trying to get recovery I wonder if you could share any wisdom you have about the, tw I assume that part of the, the treatment that people are receiving uh, in, these, in these situations is ab around giving them tools to be able to go back out either after the course of treatment in general or whenever they're not in the facility and they're at home and in their lives, et cetera tools and supports that they can carry around with them. I, I wondered if, if that is the case, if you could give us examples of, of, you know, some of that kind of thing. Are you talking like for a job specific or? Um, no, but more like just like, so when the person is in your facility, I assume that they're meeting with, I don't know, therapy, like, well, maybe I should f reframe it and just ask you, when somebody uh, is, on, is in the course of treatment, what would a visit to the facility look like? You know, standard, okay, I've got to, I'm, I'm, I'm going there today. Mm -hmm. what, 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 what would that look like? Who, who are they talking to? What are they, what are they talking about? Sure. I, I understand now. Um, what it comes down to is after they do their first initial intake, going through the medical and the clinical, and they meet with the, uh, uh, the physician, the next day they come in, they set their plan. So an everyday situation of coming in, they'll be meet, greeted at the front door uh, by our, our staff at there, and then uh, they may have to wait in the waiting room for a little bit, but then they will meet with their provider, um, whether it's a therapist or a doctor, or whatever is going on in that particular session. Uh, they have closed, closed doors. It's all privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it could be telehealth, too, because right now with mm -hmm. the, the, the shortage of, of medical professionals and therapists and so forth. It's just not here in Massachusetts, it's nationwide. So we'll utilize um, our other providers that could be down in Hyannis or, or Lowell, mm -hmm. and even though the appointment's in, uh, in uh, Arlington. Mm -hmm. So they're not gonna not have an appointment. They'll always have that opportunity to see someone, whether it's face-to-face -face or through telehealth. And that's and that basically you were saying could be a therapist, it could be a physician. It just kind of depends on what is going on with that particular patient, Correct. what clear, clearly what their needs are, and 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 how to address those. Correct. Um, and is these are outpatient treatment uh, clinics. Um, does that mean that uh, that really it, it might be just as a, a visit? Uh, it, it's, it's not necessarily a daily visit that's required for any length of time or anything like that. It really just works with, you work with every patient's individual schedules. Correct. So it, they could be coming in, most of the time it's once a week, depends on what, how, how often the provider wants to see that particular uh, patient. Um, but again, we have, we have 12 centers throughout the, uh, the state and, and 80 throughout the country and we only 
utilize the telehealth for the uh, professional, uh, the providers here in Massachusetts. Uh, so we're lucky on that aspect. So if we're, uh, if someone's out a particular day, but we usually have the, 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 the patients always seeing the same person all the time. So mm -hmm. this continuity and consistency. Yeah, I would assume that's a really important right. piece of things. Um, you were talking about how um, there is a shortage, as, as I think most people are aware of, that there's a real shortage in, uh, on the health care professional side um, and that you guys then need to make use of telehealth in order to make up for that, among other things, um, which makes sense. The, but that makes me uh, wonder, what are the challenges? That's clearly a big challenge, right? Just having enough providers. Um, and being able to access enough providers. Any other challenges that are really glaring or that you could, that you'd want uh, our audience to know about in, a ta in tackling this really difficult stuff? Therapist is a big one right now. Uh, we can't find enough therapists. Uh, there's a shortage. There's a lot of, lot of people that are dealing with a lot of issues right now. Uh, for a lot of different things. It could be addiction, it could be depression, it could be a lot of different things for, that have happened over the last amount of years with uh, the COVID. It's affected a lot of people, adults and young children. Mm -hmm. And the therapist is an area that is a shortage here in Massachusetts and throughout, like you said, the, the country. So that's probably, there could be a little bit of a wait time in some areas, uh, depends on the center that we have. Um, but by and large, we're trying to see our patients right away because they need to, they need to be seen, uh, not, not tomorrow, today. Mm -hmm. And I know that Brightview itself has been in business for about eight years now. Um, and I'm wondering whether you see, you know, whether that's long enough for you to get a sense of things are getting better, things are getting worse. What, what lies in front of us? Well, it's not going, to, it's not going away anytime soon. It's going to be, unfortunately, it's going to be here for a long time. And uh, we're continually educating people about the addiction, the disease. Mm -hmm. You know, and we, if we treat the disease like any other disease, we can help people recover. Um, and obviously, you know, the opioids is, is uh, the situation there is, is a major issue, and uh, we help, you know, people get off the, off the opioids. It's going to help a lot of other things, too. Okay, you know, our time has already, you know, come, you know, is coming to a conclusion. It goes very fast all, all the time when we're talking here. Um, but I wanted to ask you if there's anything else that you just, you want to make sure that uh, people, under, that our audience understands that we hadn't, haven't yet mentioned or that we didn't cover sufficiently. Like I said, at Brightview, we treat people as people. We treat the addiction as a disease. And we're, we're here with open arms to help them all out. They walk in, we're going to get them seen, and we're going to help them on, uh, live a better life. Great, and you know we want to remind people that Brightview is, of course, one of a number of different providers of this sort, um, and we've asked you here to to speak to the general situation. We really appreciate you doing such. Appreciate it, James. Um, I have been speaking to Will Lacouture, who is, uh, as we mentioned before, the uh, director for community outreach for Brightview, Massachusetts, all 12 facilities, 12, right? Correct. Um, and we really do appreciate Will taking the time to come and join us and educate us. Um, we appreciate your time as well. This has been Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan. We'll see you next time.